I guess it's unusual that uh, that I've gone ahead and approved this documentary, but it, but I understand that uh, uh, this documentary does focus more predominantly on the the 50 years of history of this unit. I also think that we have an obligation to the public to let them know a little bit about this quite outstanding unit. And also, I have an obligation to my soldiers and all those soldiers that preceded the current generation over the last 50 years to give them the recognition that they deserve. We take you beyond the stereotypes to reveal the unexpected story of the real people who set out to transform SAS from the ugly duckling of the Australian Army into Australia's force of first choice. The philosopher Thomas Hobbes said that war is a combination of force and fraud. Conventional forces tend to focus on the delivery of force. Now, whilst the SAS also has that capability, it really lives in the world of fraud. SAS converted their rifles illegally to imitate the sound of a heavy machine gun. This often tricked the VC into thinking a small SAS patrol was a big force. We were not afraid of the American GIs, Australian infantry, or even B-52 bombing. But we hated the Australian SAS Rangers because they make comrades disappear very suddenly. There is a bit of a subculture within the regiment that's referred to as the SAS Water Ops Mafia. Generally quite uh, extroverted A-type personalities, uh, very, very fit by the nature of being Special Forces divers and very, very headstrong. I worked in Norway for three months with the Special Boat Service and the Royal Marines uh, doing my Arctic warfare training. After completing the icebreaking drill in good old British fashion, you had an option to drink some warm rum and there were a string of young Royal Marine commandos coming behind me who wouldn't drink their rum at all, so I asked if I could have their shots as well. So after having about six shots of Royal Navy rum, I found I was skiing the best I've ever skied after that. <laughs> Scared, Ken. Sports parachutist would go be taken to 2,000 feet or 2,500 feet and he'd be taught how to exit the aircraft. We were taken to 10,000 feet and just thrown out and to sort ourselves out quick smart. The sky, the ground, the sky, the ground, the sky, the ground, and you just tumble, uh, sink or swim. The glamour boys always seem to be the free followers or the assault swimmers. But I can tell you that life in vehicle mounted is completely miserable. In the heat of summer, you, you boil in, in a vehicle. There is no protection from the dust or the flies or the heat. In the depths of winter, even the nights in the desert in the summertime, it's bitterly cold. You eat a rat. You get to um, eat boiled animal blood. Um, anything that's got any nutrition, you'll eat it. We'd had bombs put in hotels in Sydney. There'd been assassinations in Australia. Terrorism was on everyone's mind. We had to build ranges that look like buses, that look like aircraft, that look like embassies, where soldiers could move and fire, and close quarter combat live firing could be conducted. Now, this was dangerous work. I pulled the pin, we got the word go, and as I just released to throw it, pulled the pin, it uh, completely fragged, and uh, consequently out of that, I lost half my hand. I made a few mistakes during my interrogation process and was thrown into a pool with your pillowcase over your head and a noose tied around my waist. The demands on the individual of counter-terrorist training really became evident uh, some years later when we had people coming down with post-traumatic stress syndrome. We were involved with the Americans in giving them information and feedback from our experience dealing back with Australia. Well, we're trying to wait for EAD to come in this morning. They're going to blow all this stuff. What General Hagenbeck and General Harrell were absolutely amazed about was when I started handing over some of our patrol reports and the detail of information, the locations, the description of the people, their clothing, their weapons, what they were doing, in some cases, what they were saying. We had 84 mm rockets firing, 66s. We had American planes come in and support us. I'm sure they took a whole foot off the top of this mountain range where the fire was coming out of. There was 
that much ordnance coming out of the planes supporting us. It was amazing. We had fast jets, we had C-130 helicopters, we had gunships coming in. The C-130, who pretty much see in the night with their radar and their night vision goggles. And the patrol commander at the time said, we could see the whole thing. We didn't want to come down and meet with you guys, they didn't think there anything left. The vehicles were, without a doubt, the best coalition special forces vehicles on the ground. The guys during the peacetime period have done an amazing job to design a vehicle and develop tactics, techniques and procedures to utilise that vehicle. You know, if they broke down, they were very easy to fix. We did a couple of engine lifts out there. Uh, we used the signposts from the main supply route, Highway 1, to create an A-frame. As we kept pushing, we didn't want to destroy any of the civilian infrastructure. The American JTAC and I, and we came up with a plan of, of breaking the sound barrier. Sounds like munitions going off. All the windows had, had broken, made an amazing impact. They came running out with, with their arms up. The best example of asymmetric warfare that I can think of probably in history was the one we saw on 9-11. Uh, the flying of several aircraft into buildings in New York City uh, was a way of hurting the United States in a manner that you just could not have dreamed about doing in a traditional military sense. Now, all of those things mitigate in favour of the use of small, highly skilled, highly directed special force operations. The greatest use of SAS, to my mind, is actually in intelligence gathering. The hard information that can only be won by somebody talking to somebody else at a particular place. Uh, using your, your strategic troops as fire brigades is, just doesn't make sense.